Hey everyone, welcome back. Thanks for joining me. And now we are on part six of the 25 Quattro S4 build series. If you haven't watched any of the ones before, no problem. Just click the I up here and you can see how we got to this point. And today we're gonna to be doing some really cool stuff. Honestly, they're kind of modifications that I wasn't totally sure I was even going to attempt when I first started this project, but I've got all my parts lined up and I'm super excited to see how this is gonna work out because this episode is all about making sure the car can breathe really, really well. I also got to play the YouTube game here for a second. Usually I wait to the end to ask for your subscription, but if you've been watching along this whole time and learning things in this series, throw me a subscribe now. It would go a long, long way for me, trust me, and like the video too if you wouldn't mind. Also, you know I'm on Instagram, right? You can always find me at Figureitouty, and I post once in a while about future projects or stuff that I'm picking away at on the weekends and evenings that end up being future episodes. And I answer a lot of DMs and, you know, jump in there with you on the comments too, so join me over there. Last thing before we get going, do you notice the audio and video might be a little better here? I got some new gear because I wanted to make sure that my videos are getting better and better this year. So if they do seem good, let me know in the comments too. I'd appreciate that. The first order of business today is to do something about this hood insulator though, because every time I bump into it, which is all the time, it just rains all this toasted yellow foam that's coming out from along the scenes here down into my nice new stuff. And basically, heat killed it once again. That's the theme of this entire car. It sort of lost its body and it can't hold itself into this slot anymore, even though there's a bunch of little plastic kind of like clips holding it up. So whatever, I'm going to pull this down. I have a much better solution for this. To replace this old crustiness, I have once again turned to DEI and they have a few different variations actually of their underhood thermal acoustic lining. I've gone with the really nice sort of like black OEM plus looking liner, but technically there is another version. There's this silver one. The material under it is basically the same, but there is a reflective silver surface. I'm sure that would be good if you're trying to reflect a lot of heat. Maybe you've got a big top mount turbo or something like that that you're worried about. But in my opinion, that doesn't look quite as good as black. And here's where I'm at. So all I did was I took the OE liner, put it on the back of my roll, traced it out, cut it with a little bit of margin on the outside. And then I traced and cut out all the inside clip holes too, because I do intend to reuse all the factory clips. I think it's gonna make it look good, but also I decided I don't wanna rely on the adhesive backing of this to hold it into place, especially because the levels aren't level. So the OE liner has some really thick spots where it sits into these pockets here and then like super, super skinny spots on the, the bracing too. And I didn't wanna like shove it in, hope it sticks, and then like have to mold it around all the bracing here. I'm just gonna have one nice, really flat piece. So what I'll do now is just cut the inside part of the sticky part out, take that off, start mounting this up, clip it up, and then I'll do a final trim when it's on the car. And now here's the result. I didn't show you a time lapse because truth be told, I got into a little trouble. You can see my cutting skills are not, not perfect. It's kind of embarrassing. It was actually a bit of a mistake to leave extra fabric on the sides. I was trying to have it all. I was trying to actually give myself a little bit more than the OE liner actually gave you so I could follow this outer line right here really well. And I did a good job up into a certain point. Then the bottom got really hard. I came in too shallow here. But aside from my horrid cutting skills, it actually looks really, really good from a couple feet away like this, especially when you notice that the OE clips are still retained here. It really came out nice and I'll just say the adhesive is super sticky so if you wanted to do this there's really no reason you need to use your clips it will stick really really well I found that it was actually a little hard to cut up on the edges once I hit the glue because there's actually a bit of a, a fiber mesh that holds it all together it's great stuff and you know what I'm happy in the end you may have noticed in the last shot there that the coolant expansion tank is missing and that's because already for the last day or so here I've been on a side mission on my main journey here Another project item sort of just fell into my lap and it fits really well with the theme of this video. So you'll understand in a second, let me show you. I have piggy pipes to install. That's exactly what I said when it was uh, impossible to not do these this episode in letting the engine breathe type of mods. And I got to give a big shout out to Corey. He's a fellow Albertan out in Airdrie, Alberta. He's the one that hooked me up with these, but go check him out on Instagram because he's got a really nice event build going on. He's underscore blue 4.2. And he's got a built engine that's uh, sleeved and fully built with AM tune stuff in there, lots of JHM parts and VF supercharger. It's turning out to be a really nice build and he's pretty close to where I am at in his build too. He's sort of patching things up and uh, just about to do the first fire up. So go check him out. So piggy pipes. Now, if you're watching this video, you're probably an S4 owner, which means you probably know all about these already. But for those of you who are uninitiated, this is actually a really simple mod to do on your stock catalytic converters or the down pipes that hold two cats, the main cat and the pre-cat. 
And all the whole point here is to free up a little bit of airflow up in the pre-cat specifically. Now, this all ties together with the secondary air injection and the emission system on the car because these things all sort of work together. Just as a quick little reminder, there is the air blower that's actually down here. And when you first start up your car, what it does is actually inject more air into the system. And then what it's trying to do is actually heat up these pre-cats as fast as possible so we can get the elements that are usually inside of these cats to heat up to a temperature where it can start burning off all the you know, unburnt hydrocarbons and, and all that bad stuff in your exhaust quicker because it's better for the environment. But as soon as that process is done, it actually just becomes a huge restriction, especially based on where the pre-cats actually are. Keep in mind the headers are only right here and it's really, really bad to put that big of a restriction that close to the exhaust ports on your engine. So what people typically do is they gut the pre-cats. They leave these ones alone, although you could do both, but you can take a long drill auger and basically run it in there and just knock out all of that stuff carefully. And also you have to be very careful about your health when you do that too. And then once all of that is out, it becomes hollow and then the airflow goes all the way down and out much easier. I'm sure you already understand the main benefits of doing piggy pipe style down pipes, and that's obviously less air restriction, hopefully a little bit more power. And personally, I'm actually really looking forward to getting some more of that mean V8 sound coming out of the exhaust. It's gonna be a little bit louder, but as I've pointed out a lot during this build series, heat management is so key in this car. You know, a cooler system is gonna to contribute to better functioning parts as a whole. And if you look in your engine bay right now, it should not be a surprise to you why there is reflective material on the back of the firewall everywhere because the cats aren't, you know, down and far away. They're literally right there. They're still very much in the engine bay and just cooking all of the hoses in the back. Now, one day in a future build series on this car, hopefully I'll have some really nice headers on the engine here. And at that point, I'd probably coat them and wrap them in some sort of heat protection too. And until I do that, I'm not gonna do anything for heat management on these. Although I just wanted to say you totally could. You could absolutely ceramic coat these up until like this point or just put some exhaust wrap on there. Whatever you can do to manage heat, you know, it's a good idea. These build series videos are not about doing DIYs, but getting these down pipes out are a bit of an arduous task and mine actually went really easy. I think I got these out in about two, maybe three hours. So I got kind of lucky, but I just want to point out a really quick version of what you would have to do to get yours out. Step number one is in the engine bay, and that's just because you have to locate the other end of the connectors for the oxygen sensors on the pre-cats. Now there's gonna be little bundles of plugs up on both sides of your engine bay. The one you're looking for is second from the right on the right-hand side, and second from the left on the passenger side. It's the six pin one, and all you have to do is unplug those and take the other end and just go feed it down so it drops down to where the cats are. Because eventually you'll have to pull down the down pipes and you don't want the other end of the plug to get caught up in here. So just have a dangle for now, it's fine. Step number two is get rid of the axle shields that go around the axle. You'll need it because you'll have to get way up there to that flange later on and you just need the access. There's three Allen bolts that wrap around this thing and they suck to get apart, I'll be honest. The top one is especially hard. I had to use a whole number of wobbles and extensions and elbows and you'll eventually get it, but it is a pain in the ass, but necessary. Pro tip for working under a car, my neck is so sore, I've learned to just roll up a towel so I can prop up my head or else your neck muscles just die. The next part that might give you a little trouble is just backing off the 13 millimeter nuts. There's three of them that are on the other side of the exhaust flange. My case was actually really easy. I had no trouble. In fact, <laughs> everyone except the bottom ones were actually quite loose, I imagine, because the people who were putting them on last time got a little lazy and it was tricky and they just couldn't tighten them down. But I got those out without any problem, no heat required, it only took a couple minutes. Moving on down the line, there's just two 16 millimeter bolts that you have to take out of the downpipe bracket. They're actually in different spots, so it's in a lower position right here on the driver's side, and then up on the passenger side, it's actually at the top up here. What did give me some problems were actually removing the oxygen sensors on the main cats. One came out with no problem, and by the way, I had about 24 hours of lead time on this. I put liquid wrench on anything that I knew I would be threading off of on the exhaust system. And one sensor came out no problem, but this one required the torch. Um, only a couple minutes of it. I have my map torch on the outside bung here to try to open it up a little bit and give me some wiggle room around the sensor threads. And a couple minutes of that, I hit it with uh, a wrench and the dead blow and she popped right out. So 
that was okay. And then upstream, you know that there's probably lots of zip ties up in the system here. I only cut the zip tie immediately after these first yellow ones because you have to actually twist and unthread these things uh, to get them out of the, the threads. But if you don't undo the zip ties, it's actually just like binding up on itself. So just cut one and you'll find that you can twist the wires enough to thread it out entirely. Last step, obviously there's just clamps holding the down pipes to the rest of the catback system. I have mine loose right now, and I'm actually gonna see if I can wiggle these pipes out and take them out the front. I don't wanna drop the cat back. Confirmed, it is absolutely possible to get your down pipes out without dropping the cat back exhaust. It's tight, but once you get the uh, little springy mid mount out, you can sort of just like pull the whole thing backwards. But also, I have better tools now. Wasn't the case when I started this project last spring, but since then I've upgraded, and uh, someone threw in the comments in a video a while ago to say, man, you gotta get on board with one of the, uh, the cordless uh, ratchets from Milwaukee or whatever brand. I have sort of leaned towards Milwaukee for a lot of my stuff now, and I got the high speed variation, and it is, it is really good. I also upgraded my, uh, my basic SAE and metric combo set. What I love about these is that, oh, that one's stuck, here we go is that they have the square edges on them too. So if you only have enough room to stick this onto the head of a, a nut or a bolt or something like that, you can actually just go take a wrench, put it around the side here and crank it down if you don't have enough room for a ratchet on the outside. But these have already saved me a few times and it's honestly just making my work here in the garage a lot more enjoyable. Okay, we need to get a little sciency here for a second so we can understand the role of the oxygen sensor and why we probably need to use spacers in this system somewhere. So show and tell first, we have the new stuff here that are fully gutted versus my old ones. And I've already swapped over the oxygen sensors in the front and my mounting hardware too. But I'm gonna switch cameras now and show you the inside of both of these cats are completely gutted. So the front one, which is what you see here, is completely gutted compared to the old one, which has a, a quite tight cell. I don't know what the count is, but you know, fully, fully catted. And then on the rear end of these things too, a lot of people don't gut the, the main cats, but these ones are. So I have, I don't know if there's a difference between half piggy and full piggy, but these are full piggy. These ones on the inside are completely gutted. Whereas you can see once again on an OE set, they're very much uh, intact with another full set of catalytic converter meshing. And science time on oxygen sensors. So there are two per side. There's one before the pre-cat and one after the pre-cat. And even though all these things do is measure oxygen, the way they use the information is different and really cool. The first sensor upstream is basically measuring the air-fuel mixture composition coming out of the combustion cycle of your engine at all times. So it has a reference of how much oxygen is in the atmosphere, it checks how much oxygen is coming through the exhaust stream, and it's basically gonna decide if it thinks that there is too much air or too little air. And it's constantly gonna send messages back to the computer, and if it thinks there is too much air, it's gonna say, hey, we must be running a little bit lean, so next time, shoot a little more gas into the cylinder, and it's constantly gonna be chasing that magical 14.7 to one air-fuel ratio of stoichiometric efficiency, and that's basically all that's gonna be going on on that first sensor. We don't really need to worry about it because we haven't changed anything upstream. We have gutted the cat, of course, but that would only affect a measurement downstream. As far as this sensor is concerned, nothing is different upstream, and it's just gonna be chilling. And that is really important because we don't want to change anything on space out the sensor. We want it to read the exact same way it always was because everything's fine. The problems, however, do happen downstream when you gut your pre-cat. So whatever oxygen is present in the exhaust flow is typically used when your cat is intact to do the reduction and oxidization processes in a catalytic converter. And essentially what that's going to mean is that less oxygen makes it to this sensor. So if we see the exact same amount of oxygen making it to here as it already started, it's gonna say, oh my God, your cat is broken and it's gonna start throwing engine codes. So what we need to do is somehow trick this sensor to thinking that there is still less oxygen present and not the exact same amount, which is what reality is. And we're gonna achieve that trickery by simply introducing a spacer. So all that really does is take the sensor out of the exhaust stream and only expose it to a small fraction of the oxygen that is still present. And it'll think that proper catalyst is happening upstream when in fact it's not, it's not even there. Once again, I found that Vibrant has exactly what I need on this project. And I've already put a link to the Amazon page in the description of this video, but I bought two of these kits. They have a really nicely machined three or four stainless steel spacer, and it comes with a brass crush ring to help with the installation. 
and they give you three options for reducers as well. So there's a medium, small, and large orifice reducer that you can choose one of and put in the end of your spacer that'll hang down into the exhaust stream and just gives you even more ability to modulate how much airflow you want coming up through the spacer and being exposed to your sensor. You can tell that I've already installed the smallest option. I'm gonna go really conservative. I think I'm gonna need it for this setup, to be honest. And I'm hoping that I can avoid having a check engine light right off the bat and not having to go under the car and messing around trying out the other reducers. But this is a really nice kit. Yes, it is two or three times more expensive than probably the two pack that you'll come across on Amazon. But my judgment of those were that the metal quality looked really, really poor and I just didn't have faith in it. And having the option for these reducers is really nice. The whiteboard does not lie. Done and piggy pipes are indeed installed now. A month ago. So if you know anything about the prairies in springtime in Canada, you kind of got to drop everything you're doing and get outside and take care of a bunch of stuff. So I did that. I'm very stuffed up with allergies now from the grass, but that's going to subside. I'm back in the garage and doing some project work here and a bit of a one month update on that downpipe install. So it wasn't perfect with the spacers. The spacers themselves are a great product, but what they accidentally do is actually push the oxygen sensors closer to one another where they actually interfere with one another. So what I had to do was clock both of the downpipes in opposite directions in order to actually make them miss each other, sort of going in opposite directions, which is totally fine. Uh, and you do have the flexibility in the pipe because the flange is not hard mounted up into the, the header and nor is it down on the cat back. So you can sort of like get a couple of degrees of rotation in there and it works out just fine. I am legitimately so excited to do this part. I've been waiting so long. It is intake manifold time. Now, yes, I am going to be walking you step by step through the flapper mod, but I want to show you why I've decided to take some time to tear this manifold down because I have a very serious problem that was robbing a ton of torque from the car. And that is the arm here, and you can see the little cup on the inside of the vacuum actuated piece right here, would not stay attached to the ball on the back of the pivot arm that moves the flap. Now, part of that is because the cup over there is getting really worn, but the other part is because this uh, pivot right here is getting really, really stiff. The mechanism isn't turning very well. And that is a problem because I'm gonna show you in this video how air flows throughout the intake manifold in the low and high RPM states. But suffice to say, my major problem right now is that when that flap cannot be moved, it is always stuck in the high RPM stage, which is really bad because when you're driving your car, most of the time you are below 5,000 RPM. So first order of business is a full teardown of the mechanism that operates the flapper arm here. And eventually I'll reassemble that and grease it up properly. But in the meantime, I just need to show you how dirty it is in here everywhere. And it's not dirt, it is truthfully, it's blow by. This is still coming through the PCV valve and coating the entire interior of the intake manifold. And so are the heads. You can see on the closer side here, it's still fully caked up. Obviously these cars are port injected, which is awesome. So the further side here, and you can see down on the, the shiny backs and stems of the, uh, the valves, they're looking pretty good. So let's hear it for port injection over direct injection. But let that be proof that there's still absolutely oily blow by getting through the PCV and down into the intake manifold and down into the head of the car too. I should also mention these intake manifold halves have already had the once over by my good friend, Mr. 992 911 that stops by the garage once in a while so we can talk about our Volkswagens. He already cleaned up a whole lot of this so it's actually not even as close as bad as it actually was. But that is all why I'm doing a catch can, but more on that later. Before I tear down the intake manifold and do that full cleaning, first I'm going to show you how the flapper works during idle and then high RPM scenarios because it's important that you understand what's going on in there so you can diagnose your own car if something's wrong, but also why the flapper mod is worth doing in the first place, and because I won't let you get away with not learning anything in this video before we actually get into the fun work. Welcome to the back side of the intake manifold. You're looking through the hole where the throttle body usually connects. And let's go through all the scenarios all the way starting from when the car is off up into the high RPM state. When the car is off, this is what you see. So the flapper is in the down position. That's the same as the high RPM state because no vacuum is being applied to the lever on the other side and therefore the spring pressure is just simply pushing down the flap. And now you start the car. Right away, vacuum pressure builds up in the system and then the pivot arm that I showed you earlier acts against the spring, pulls the arm upwards and it rotates the flapper instantly up into the low RPM position so that the flapper is up 
and you can see down at the bottom that the only direction that the air has to go once it gets inside of the intake manifold is down into one of those eight little velocity stacks at the bottom. Let's look at the other half of the story here and give you an appreciation for how we get that low RPM long runner power. Now pretend that the flap is in the up position right now because I'm not going to hold the spring. And let's take this port right here for example. So I know I said air only gets through each of the stacks, but technically the hole right behind it is always open too. That's why we have the interior scoops here. So air is always, in one way or another, finding its way down, first of all. This goes down, makes a loop, comes out of the port on the opposite side, which is sandwiched connected to the upper half. Air continues on its loop, and it goes by this opening, because remember the flap is up, so all of these are closed right now. The air makes a long loop and then boom, down into the head port, which always ends up being the port right behind the stack. So let's say you're cruising down the freeway now and some hot boy rolls up on you in his B8S4 with that supercharged V6 and you wanna show him that these old girls still got what it takes. So you pin it and when you pass that 4,700-ish RPM range, the vacuum instantly cuts on the front of the intake manifold and drops down the flapper so now air can rush through in a shorter path straight up through those ports that have just been revealed. Once again, the other half of the story here is the flap is down just as it is right now. And you don't have to do that big loop. You don't have to go down and up and around and out of this port right here. In this case, air is just trying to find the fastest way through. So some of it might go through the long route, but all of these are finally open now. So you can see the shortest track might actually be in through the back, straight through here, straight into the head. So now with everything you just learned, it should be pretty obvious why people like doing the flapper mod. You can see the thickness of it right here would create turbulence. So in the scenario, as we see it, flap is down. You're trying to suck in as much air as you can through the back and get it quickly and smoothly up into that short intake runner path. The thickness here is creating air turbulence and it's blocking your ability to do that. So what if you took something that was about this thick and replaced it with something that was only about this thick? So I have the quick and unique opportunity here to do some myth busting. So you've probably heard about the infamous screws in the intake manifold that can back themselves out and fall into your engine and do some harm. Well, I have the screws right here that are indeed backing out. I know it won't focus really well on this camera, but this one's about maybe a third of the way out and about three or four out of the total eight in here are doing that. And the myth is that they can indeed back out and fall into your engine. Whereas some people say that no matter what, they can't back all the way out because they'll back into the next screw below it and it can't possibly fall out. So what I'm going to do here is just back one out until it's on basically its last thread and uh, do it right above one that's fully seated. So in other words, there is the most room it should ever have to do this. And then I'll give the whole thing a good shake and some vibration and see if this thing actually can fall out. I have my answer and it was really easy. No real testing required. So these screws cannot fall out and I'll show you why. So on a side where both of the screws are completely tightened down, you can see that both halves of the intake manifold can, you know, sandwich together. You could close this and seal it if you wanted to. But on this side, look at the huge gap that's forming. You could not tighten these two together. There is so much contact occurring from the head of the screw coming down and making contact at the bottom. There's no way that the screw would have enough room to fall out. There's actually a myth 1.5 about these screws too, which is that you can remove them when you're at the point that I am too, because they're not needed anymore. And why they're not needed is based on the principle that even though they're technically in here holding the middle part of the casting down, you don't need them because the castings are also going to be pressing against each other, but with full force because the edges of these lines right here press down on right here. So there's no way that they could detach from one another. So I'll prove that too. I'm going to take out these screws, see how loose those central castings get and see if potentially they could fall out of place a little bit. Because keep in mind, air is rushing through here. And if those channels are not airtight, it's going to be a bit of a, a sloppy airflow in there trying to suck air into each cylinder. Yep, that one's absolutely true. You can take those screws out. How do I know? Because I just spent like three days, probably evening and uh, weekend here, cleaning out both halves. I steeped these in cleaners and Dawn dish soap and I scrubbed them up and threw lots of lots of hot water. These castings, they're not gonna move. Even when they're not sandwiched together, these things cannot come out. So don't worry about it. But like I just said, it took a lot of work to clean these. And ironically, I would have thought that all the blow by and garbage would have settled into the bottom half. It did not. It fell into the top half, got sucked around and maybe baked off, 
and I found the, the runners to be extremely dirty. And I don't just mean like thick grease. I mean, I've barely been able to get it off. I've still probably got like, I don't know, 5% stuck on here. But what's extra weird is that I found the uh, passenger side to be the worst one by far on the top half. And I have a, a working theory right now that the, uh, the big valve right there in the top, the passageway that gets the PCV air sucked into it, I have a feeling that when it comes through the back and the flapper is facing down that way, I think it just naturally gets sucked into the, the driver's side and that's why it's so bad. But I could have not done this cleaning job without this little kit of brushes that I bought from Amazon. And uh, I'll put the links into the description of this video. It's actually two. There's these guys, which I found really helpful to get into the runners and get in there really, really good. And then I also got a set of these nylon, stainless steel and brass bristled brushes. Um, so like I said, you can pick up those on Amazon if you want, but I highly, highly recommend doing this. Even if you're not doing the, the flapper mod, I've always been a big fan of just good maintenance and cleaning, and that'll get you performance and longevity out of your car, even if you don't do any other performance mods. I feel really good that I went in and did this, especially because I found the intake elbow here to be really kicked up on the inside, and then the throttle body was just gross too. And these are all nice and clean. I'm about to put this back together with some fresh gaskets from FCP. We are at flapper mod time, but I just want to point out two things that I found during cleaning here because my actuator arm was pretty sticky from moving inside of the intake manifold. That was due to kind of two major things. So number one, when you take this piece out of the front of the intake manifold, there is a regular old seal here, and if that is not working or it's gummed up, you can have the PVC blow-by basically shooting out of the front and making it a, a big mess in your engine bay. So watch out for that. But then on the inside, you see there's another sort of like brown seal in there. That's what seals around this part right here. Mine was so gummed up with stuff. I uh, cleaned all that out and cleaned off the end right here too. So we should have a nice smooth movement. And of course, I'll uh, grease it up on the way back in, but just keep an eye out for that. In my hand is the OEM flapper, detached already, obviously. Got a little ahead of myself during cleaning, although that was kind of important to do. So as you can imagine, you just take out some stuff on the front of the intake manifold, slide out the rail right here, and then you can get going on these four springs that are inside of the back. Now here's a clip that I screwed up the audio in, but my point is I found a way to remove this flap without damaging anything. Normally you're instructed to put a screwdriver into the end of the clips and just like break them out of these little tabs, but this video proves that you can just take a screwdriver, shove it against the spring, and then use a pick to pop them out. And what's great is you get to retain this piece of OEM hardware. It's not great that we're always destroying parts of the intake manifold during this mod. You never know who might be able to use this part, and uh, you could resell it yourself or keep it in the stash if you had to revert to OE. It's always good to have options. So just FYI, there is another way. Let's kick it off by talking about materials. So obviously the OE flapper is plastic, and you know what? It damages. I know you probably won't be able to see it very well, but up here on the front edge, that would be at the back of the intake manifold, these little joints here that are meant to get a really good seal on the manifold is broken. So I don't know if something came flying through, if this is just heat and time, but this is actually degrading. This was slowly failing. Now I'm sure you have read about this mod before and on forums, people are very uh, commonly going with nylon hardware to secure everything. And that's great, so am I. This is all this is. I got this from my local Lowe's. I've got some spacers and some other bits I'll show you later. And the whole point of going with nylon is that it is, once again, heat resistant and chemical resistant. But if it falls apart and goes into your engine, it's not gonna damage a valve or anything else. It'll just get crushed or whatever. And it's better than having a piece of metal fall in. But what I think I might be the first person to do here is to use UHMD, which is ultra high molecular density plastic for the flapper itself. Psych, I meant to say UHMW, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. The benefit to going with this, not just temperature resistance, because this is really good for high temps, but it's also really, really resistant to chemicals. And I mean like over the top resistant compared to some other plastics or composites. So all I did was I searched a, a local plastics commercial place here in the city in Edmonton, and they had a sheet of three millimeter UHMD, which is what this is and I got them to cut it to spec. Okay, I fibbed a little bit. It's actually 3.3 millimeter, but it's really tough stuff for what it is. Now, the spec I requested it to be cut to is exactly 12 inches by three inches. 
By the way, if you measure your OE flapper, you'll see that it is just an absolute hair over one foot and one eighth inch, whereas the top of the manifold itself is actually one sixteenth below a foot. So the moral of the story is that the OE flapper is a little bit larger than the hole itself, and my piece is somewhere in the middle of the two, but that's because the OE design has this little ridge here that is meant to inset and get a really good seal on the top of the manifold, but of course that is still our objective too. There's actually two really useful points of reference here when you mock this up. Now what you'll notice is that the holes right here, once they are above the OEM location on the flap, they are perfectly centered on the flap. That's where the springs used to be. And then when you take it apart, you would notice that the flap itself is centered between the furthest points out here on the arm. Which means with my 12 by 3 piece cut here, it is not more complicated than drawing a line right down the middle and then making sure that my holes are located along that center line. Then I can mark out my four holes to start drilling. Those steps are done. So you can see, drew my line, took the arms, boop, found my middle spots there. And then I used a centering punch. If you haven't used one of these before, this is a great time to just go pick one up. They're pretty cheap, but what this is, is you press down on the exact spot you want to drill and it creates a little indentation so that when you come in with your drill bit, it doesn't walk on you. It actually just drills straight through exactly where you want it. So did that and I slowly bored them out to quarter inch because that is the size of the hardware I'm using for this. A little bit larger than I think people typically use, but I wanted lots of good contact here. But it did mean that I had to also open up these holes just a little bit. If you use 3 16 or whatever that equivalent is in metric, you won't have to do this, but it wasn't a big deal. So quarter inch it is. After a bunch of experimentation, moving washers around and experimenting with how much width might be good to close evenly against the top of the manifold, this is the configuration I landed on that I'm pretty happy with. And I'll give you the specs so you can use it as a jumping off point or just replicate it. And I think what is the most important measurement to keep in mind here, Respecting the fact that you guys might not have the same thickness of flapper material that I chose. Again, I have about a 3.3 millimeter flap here, but if you go to four or five, whatever you want, what's important is the total distance here from the very top to where the flapper arm meets. In other words, the distance that you're going to cover with a nut or washers or spacers or whatever you want and the thickness of the flap itself has to come in right around nine millimeters. That's what I found to be the sweet spot. I was really lucky. I achieved that randomly through the thickness of material that I pre-selected and then just one single nut screwed down nice and tight and this is a quarter inch interior thread, just a standard quarter inch nut that I picked out of a bin. That came to the, the distance that I needed. I do have a whole bunch of these little washers right here that I tried spacing with but what I'll show you in a second is Boosting up the total height in the middle actually isn't super helpful because it's all about leverage on the arm pushing up against the top of the manifold that really matters in the end. And here's the function. So pretty good, but look at the very top. You can see there's a little gap there. I'm going to squeeze really hard. It goes away. Loose, squeeze, loose, squeeze. So I have about half a millimeter there or maybe less than that that it's not perfectly sealing. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of leverage. There's only so much force that the one single connection point in the middle of the flap can apply to the far outer edges, which I suspect is why a spring was a part of the original design. And when I say spring, I mean these things right here, the four springs that distribute the force of the middle of the OE flap out to the outer edges makes a lot of sense why this was used. So keep in mind, we're looking at the back of the intake manifold right now. See how it's all shiny here? That is because I had to file it down. So if you've seen this other shot, I was using a flat edge because I noticed that the flap in my test fitting, it wasn't closing flat, but it had nothing to do with my spacing. I could tell something was pushing back against it. There were high points on both sides actually. It looked intentional actually from the factory too, just on the back side that were a little high. So I ended up filing them down just a little bit just to make sure that the whole surface was flat for this modification and then it helped fit up the flap a lot better. My very last note here about the modification is I used my deburring tool to actually shave off just a little bit of material on the top inside part of this here because I noticed that when my flap was coming up, it was making a little bit of frictional contact on the top part of the, the manifold and I don't want there to be any contact. I want nothing to be standing in the way of one nice smooth movement and closing this flush. 
Now that all my test fitting is done and I'm on to final assembly, I'm going to hit some of the hardware here with a little bit of this Permatex Ultra Gray. It's the same stuff that I'll be using to seal the intake manifold in a second, but I'm just gonna put a little dab on this, a little bit around the nuts, and then once I sandwich this all together on the back side of my caps too, just to make sure that things don't vibrate apart. Done deal, clamshell is all done up. And I actually thought I was pretty liberal with my sealant, but I've noticed in actually quite a few spots, it didn't seep out of the sides. So it means that you can really go hard on it. The instructions for Permatex Ultra Gray says that you can put down a two to six millimeter bead. And I definitely went on the high side of that. And like I said, I still don't know if I got like perfect, perfect coverage. And there's no really way to, to pressure test this until you put it on the car and hopefully listen for some whistles or, or whatever might give you an indication that you might have a leak. So I'm gonna hope for the best. And in the meantime, I'm ready to move on. And I have one more little modification to do here. It's time to fix that issue I mentioned earlier where my flapper was always running in high RPM mode because the little ball here wouldn't stay inside of the cup. And I have a very simple solution for that. Might not be elegant, but I'm gonna go ahead and just drill a hole through the back of this and through the arm here. And I will mechanically attach it just with a little piece of my 18 gauge mechanics wire here, sort of like a cotter pin, but I'll just tie it off on the end. Nice and simple, you can barely see it at the bottom here. And it gives a nice firm connection on the arm there. This is not going anywhere. The turtle has flipped on its shell because yes, of course, we've got to put some gold wrap on here. That's what you would get out of any kind of ported intake from JHM or Jackal. But I've gone once again to DEI, they have the reflective gold reflective barrier. And this is just a peel and stick. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it on the bottom. <laughs> For how meticulous a person I am, I did a terrible job laying this down. It's not like it's hard to use, it's actually really easy. I just did such a bad job contouring it. I'm sure you can do better. Nonetheless, look how clean the runners are. We've got heat management taken care of. Obviously I've got on the elbow and throttle body now with some fresh gaskets. You can see kind of poking through there. We have come a long, long way and we actually have one more little thing to do. I picked up JHM's coolant bypass kit for the intake elbow on the S4 here. And the entire point is simply to block off the coolant entrance and exit that goes through the elbow here. This is by design from Audi to make sure that there's a little bit of warm coolant flowing through and actually keeping the throttle body from sticking if you're winter driving the car or you just live in a cold climate. But the truth is I will not be winter driving this car. And obviously I've just gone through a lot of effort to make sure that we keep the air intake temps nice and low. So this is just one nice little bonus thing that you can do. It's only a couple dollars to make sure that we're keeping those temps low. The second part of the kit is just this brass barbed fitting here, and you'll use that to connect the two coolant hoses that you just bypassed. However, I'm not gonna do that right now because it's gonna get in the way of the intake manifold insulation, which I'm gonna do next episode. This episode's gone a little bit long. I know we wanted to get to the catch can, and that's what we're gonna start with next time. So thank you so much for joining me. We covered a lot of information today. I hope you learned something as usual. And please, like I said before, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and please like this video. Thanks again, see you next time.